Thank you so much, Madison, and thank you to our speakers for being here today. Um, my name is Julie McDonald. I work with Minnesota's Lake Superior Coastal Program. I'm one of the founders and planners of these climate conversations, which have been underway since around 2015. Um, I'm really glad you're here today um, to join us. The topics inspire different people, uh, depending on the topic. So overall, uh, to let you know, our aim with these conversations is to support our coastal communities and understanding the climate changes that are upon us, expand the knowledge of how we can adapt, mitigate and be resilient to the impacts from the changing climate. Um, and then if someone, Madison or someone else could just uh, let people in from the waiting room, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so on, the, on today's topic, you may have noticed uh, the topics of climate migration and potential destination cities have received some attention in the media, even national media about our little old Duluth here. There are many un unanswered questions about climate migration. And while some have pointed to the Great Lakes region as a potential destination <clears throat> for climate migrants, as the region has desirable assets such as fresh water, some current modeling shows uncertainty about the actuality of migration to this destination. But regardless of what some say or think, most of us are aware it is a priority to increase, <clears throat> excuse me, increase community and local government resilience to the changing climate. What if 25,000 people do migrate to our small city, your small city? How much land and infrastructure is needed to accommodate these numbers of new residents? This is something that can be projected and visualized for improved understanding and for building capacity at the local level. The talk of climate migration and destination cities is somewhat new territory for most, if not all of us. As we delve into the topic and hear about some research and projects, I'd like to request that you make a note of your reactions. If you see this and think of somebody else that must see it too, make a note. Recordings of this and past presentations are hosted on the Minnesota on a Minnesota Sea Grant webpage. And there will certainly be more opportunities in the future for your colleagues or others in the community to engage on the topic. Our first speaker today is Dr. Derek Van Berkel. He is faculty with School for the Environment and Sustainability at University of Michigan. Dr. Van Berkel is using his expertise in geospatial data sciences, landscape architecture, and conservation, and initiating conversations now with key stakeholders. His work is aiding communities by asking questions, modeling, creating scenarios, and developing methods and technology tools for increased community engagement to support just transitions. Some key questions are, what do we need to change right now to accommodate migrants? Are there spaces to preserve places we do not want developed? What do residents want for their community? Dr. Van Berkel will be developing a participatory GIS platform for five Great Lakes communities. Duluth has been selected as one of them. This model is being designed that makes these urban projections, scenarios, and engages with city and residents to work through scenarios and identify what they want for the future of their community. And now with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Van Berkel. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, Madison, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I hope everybody, I assume people are at lunch right now, and I just want to thank everybody for taking the time um, during their lunch break to uh, to hear this talk. Um, that was a pretty extensive uh, introduction. So I am from the School for Environment and Sustainability, and I'm an assistant professor there. Um, and the reason I'm giving a talk uh, in Minnesota is be basically because I'm part of the GLISA uh, project. So the GLISA project um, is basically a NOAA-funded project um, with collaborations throughout um, Great Lakes states um, and also communities within the Great Lakes states and um, 
and then all, also different kind of universities and that sort of thing. So it stands for the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessment. And the idea behind this initiative is basically to use climate data to um, have conversations about making cities and regions um, more sustainable, more resilient. Um, so we've been doing that for the last 10 years or so, engaging with different communities. Um, and over the next five years, we are going to kind of, um, or we're taking on this, this idea of migration. Um, and that is indeed for different uh, cities within the Great Lakes. Um, we are, our, our team at the University of Michigan, we're social scientists. So we are uh, really interested in engaging with communities and trying to understand how best uh, to communicate this information. And um, yeah, it's, I think it's um, kind of some practical science in, in a way that we, we try to provide tools that will help people think through some of the challenges um, that they're going to face because of climate change. When we started to think about migration, um, it, ans it brought up a lot of, um, a lot of questions like um, Julie had, had, had mentioned. Um, and so I'm going to try to bring you through the story of our own discussions about what, what we can, can contribute uh, to this conversation. Um, I think certainly this conversation has really been touched off by the experience of, of many Americans throughout um, uh, the US that are experiencing some extreme events. Um, uh, I think you can turn on a TV today and probably see one of these events. Uh, so uh, for instance, in California, they're suffering from, um, from drought and wildfires um, in the Gulf states. Um, they're often hit by hurricanes. Uh, we also have continuing issues of sea level rise, tornadoes in some regions. And so I think this conversation started with that in mind, that the fact that people living in these regions um, they might start to think, you know, maybe the risk of living near this kind of, these kind of hazards um, might outweigh, you know, whatever um, reason that they're living in those locations. And, and certainly when we look at the Great Lakes, there's a lot of conversation about the fact that, um, yeah, it might be a destination. Certainly in the news media, there's a lot of talk uh, of this. So, some, some are describing the Great Lakes area as a, as a haven or a, kind of a, a climate um, a resilient uh, region. And a lot of this conversation revolves around the fact that we have um, this large um, natural resource of, of you know, uh, fresh water. So this conversation is, is kind of revolves around the fact that um, we might be able to um, have a blue economy, um, new industries that are related to this, especially in the context um, where there's scarcity within other parts of the region of, of fresh water. There's also this thought that um, kind of the fact that you know, the Great Lakes sometimes experience and it's cold weather and that sort of thing, that, that will become milder because of climate change that will be, make uh, you know, a more attractive place to live. So we won't have, um, such, uh, I guess, uh, uh, of a deep freeze uh, in the winter and that sort of thing. I also think that many cities are thinking about this in the context of deindustrialization. I think many cities in the Great Lakes area have experienced uh, kind of outmigration and loss of jobs, and they're thinking about uh, this immigration as an adaptation that we could potentially reinvigorate cities with new population, with um, increasing tax bases and um, kind of increasing the amount of services that people could um, gain from having more population. Our own research has kind of reinforced this idea that um, the Great Lakes area is kind of attractive. If you think about uh, kind of the environmental or the social risks uh, across the US. So basically what we did is we looked at some uh, different measures, one from FEMA, 
that looks at the losses, the economic losses from natural hazards, things like forest fires and uh, tornadoes and that sort of thing, and counts those and then looks at social vulnerability and community resilience within counties across the US. And what you kind of see, um, if you look at these kind of orange little uh, squares here, is that, and this blue line, which is the average for all, all of the US, many of the states and counties within uh, the Gleesa area, the Great Lakes area, are well below that, that national average. So we are less exposed to some of um, things like hurricanes and that sort of thing. So we are not exposed to those as much. So there's this um, kind of evidence that, you know, this is a good place to live um, in this context. And here is uh, Minnesota uh, specifically. We also looked at social vulnerability from the CDC and looked at uh, kind of socioeconomic status and things like household composition and disability and minority status and housing type. And again, what we're seeing is that a lot of the um, Great Lake um, states are well below the national average. So um, there's less social vulnerability within um, these states. So this is basically Minnesota, again, below the national average. But what do we, we actually know about uh, migration? Um, there's actually not too much known. Um, there is a researcher named uh, Matt Hauer out of Florida who's done most of the work kind of projecting where um, our best guess is for where population might increase um, over the next uh, 100 years or so. And in these projections, basically Matt looks at the demographic competition position of, uh, of counties throughout the U.S. And what um, this research is finding is that those compositions, because the Great Lakes area is this aging area, that we it would be a very uh, large challenge to replace that population with uh, immigration. So their best guesses when they look at kind of economic uh, fortunes throughout the, the country is that the Great Lakes are still going to be places where um, there is population decline. I will say that these are based on uh, specific assumptions about kind of economic, um, I don't know, futures and that sort of thing. And so I think if you probably ask Matt, there's a lot of uncertainty of where we think population might um, uh, kind of increase in the US uh, over the next 100 years. And so with that background in mind, we've had a lot of conversations and basically come up to the conclusion that this is a big question mark. We, we're um, extremely uncertain where people will move, if they will move, um, how they will move and that sort of thing. So because this is a really complex um, phenomenon basically, so we know that you know, federal policies and regulations will um, will definitely impact this. Um, we know that um, that the pull factors, you know, are they enough? Um, you know, there's many great places to live in the U.S. And um, why exactly would people move uh, to the Great Lakes? Um, th this kind of opens up conversations about how cities within the Great Lakes could attract uh, folks. And there's kind of competition between uh, different cities and that sort of thing. There's also this question um, that is maybe hasn't been really asked is that are we actually prepared um, for an influx or even climate change in, in these cities? Um, many cities in the Great Lakes are, um, they were you know, developed a, a long time ago. So their infrastructure and their infrastructure hasn't been improved over a, a long period of time. So there's questions if they would actually be prepared for this influx uh, of residents. And then another kind of open question is, how would um, the existing residents feel about these changes? Um, one of the things that is often brought up is this idea of gentrification. Um, so, you know, what if this influx of population came, would that cause gentrification? It's kind of force um, uh, existing uh, 
residents to kind of change um, where they live and that sort of thing. So this all led to the conclusion of our group that we are maybe better um, positioned to um, have a broader conversation about this because we, we don't know where population will come, but we can contribute to a, a conversation about preparing, about thinking about the future of cities and trying to um, have those conversations about uh, sustainability and resilience in cities. And our uh, kind of hypothesis is that um, if we can have those conversations about the future, if we can provide information of our best guess about the future, then that will make cities more, hopefully make them more resilient, make them anticipate some of the, the challenges that they may face. But also um, by doing that, they can uh, create more sustainable cities that might be attractive uh, for uh, migrant migrants. So I'm going to kind of lead you on the path that we um, are taking, um, it, kind of using Duluth as the example. Um, so we are going to be creating uh, an online tool that will address some of the issues within Duluth, really because Duluth is kind of the poster child of this, this conversation. Um, uh, there was a, a researcher from Harvard, um, Jesse uh, Keenan, who actually uh, described uh, Duluth as the most climate-proof city in America. And I think if you Google um, kind of Duluth and climate change, you'll probably um, come up with a number of articles. So Duluth, um, in his kind of analysis, was uh, had many advantages, uh, basically because of um, and it's access to water and, and the fact that um, it was going to become a little bit milder. So our climate projections are basically saying that Duluth around 60 years might feel like um, Toledo, Ohio. So that the milder climate and the fact that it was kind of a, an attractive city, that it might be a destination for people. Um, but in talking to um, kind of city managers, um, people that live um, uh, or work in cities and that sort of thing um, in Duluth and in other cities in the Great Lakes area. I think um, there was a bit of a, a question mark for them because they are facing challenges at the moment um, without even having to think about, uh, you know, accommodating uh, new folks. One of those things being this infrastructure question. Um, can we basically accommodate um, climate change um, with our existing uh, infrastructure? I mean, just 10 years ago, Duluth experienced kind of a, a really extreme flood and that was, they basically found about, you know, the infrastructure uh, could not accommodate these, uh, these things. So for city managers, I think throughout the Great Lakes area, this is a big question mark and how do we start to plan for, um, you know, increased amount of precipitation. Um, so there's a really cool website that you can maybe go to, it's called Risk Factor, and you can look at any city within um, in the US and kind of look at some of the risk factors or the, that um, they face. So I went to Risk Factor and I basically looked for Duluth. And what I found is that there's kind of a, a, a moderate uh, flooding risk and a very low uh, or minor uh, fire risk. But in a scenario where climate changes, um, our best guess or that we were gonna have, we're gonna actually have a lot more precipitation um, throughout Minnesota and that there's gonna be more um, days of extreme heat. So that was obviously gonna change um, some of these uh, risks, these current risks, okay? So this is, a, this is a important information to think about when, when thinking about uh, future infrastructure needs. And that sort of thing. I think a lot of cities um, in the Great Lakes are also challenged to think about um, equity in their cities. Um, uh, if um, I, this is, these are basically official st statistics of Duluth and um, the percent poverty uh, folks uh, in uh, in poverty are is greater than 
uh, Minnesota as a whole and United States. Um, I think um, the de-industrialization of many cities without, within the Great Lakes has kind of confronted uh, folks with the fact that there is this in inequity. And, and that um, is obviously in many cities in the US, it's, it's related to kind of redlining and kind of structural um, uh, kind of racist policies and that sort of thing. But what, what that means for many cities is that um, there are kind of winners and losers. And so um, here you can just uh, see that 40% of people um, within kind of the, the downtown area of Duluth and uh, kind of metro area are 185% of the federal poverty level. So they're less than that. So these are questions that many cities in the Great Lakes area are dealing with. So when we actually look at the population in uh, Duluth, we, we, we're basically seeing that it's uh, somewhat stagnant. It's, it's uh, kind of slightly uh, decreasing, but it's, it's probably just staying the same, despite kind of the, I don't know, the, 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 the kind of the high profile that um, the, it as being a climate haven has has, has caused. Um, so I think this kind of assumption that you know that Duluth you know would just kind of stay the same population is just that it's an assumption, and I think um, it's a really important thing to consider that there might be um, uh, increasing population. And so the way we're we're think, uh, we're addressing this is we're basically creating one of these online tools, one of the five that we're um, engaging with the different community. And so I'm going to um, kind of give a rundown of what this actually entails um, and kind of go through the different functionality of these tools. So the main piece um, that we're uh, developing for Duluth and for a couple of other cities is an urban change model. Um, this is basically our best guess at um, where development might happen within a city. You can think about um, the popular, um, I don't know, computer game SimCity. Um, what we try to do is try to uh, model what we think, uh, how we think development will happen. Uh, this is not uh, kind of based on you know, being a mayor uh, of the Sim City, but it's actually based on our own projections and kind of scientific principles and kind of computer coding. What that allows us to do is answer those questions. Um, what happens if 50,000 uh, uh, people move to our city? Uh, where will they, uh, where will that development happen? Um, and then how might that um, intersect with um, future climate change stressors. What we basically do is we look at remotely sensed images and we, we try to describe where new development has happened. So this is in 2000, this is what Duluth looked like in 2001, and this is what it looks like uh, now. Okay, so you can see uh, specific areas in red that are developing. What we do is we look at those areas and we try to describe um, what it is about those locations um, that makes development attractive or um, why kind of planners and developers decided to develop at those locations. And that allows us to make um, kind of a layer that says, this is a suitable location based on what we've seen from the past of where development could happen. We then use population projections and then we try to allocate that population in suitable locations. And we run our model many, many, many times to see where those development uh, areas happen. Okay. One second. I am going way too long. So um, this is basically what it looks like. Um, this is a Grand Rapids area. And so we can kind of project out from here. Um, and so we're going to develop this for Duluth. And then we can um, overlay different maps to see um, where there might be some challenges in the future. So this is a flooding map in Grand Rapids. This is another region in Colorado looking at fire risk. 
And we're going to integrate this all in our model. I'm going to hopefully go um, quickly and then demonstrate for you what this will look like. So um, I'm going to actually put the URL of one of these tools. So this is for Grand Rapids, but we're going to develop this for um, uh, for for Duluth. So this is our urban projection. So we have an urban projection tool, we have an explore map, and then we have a planning tool, which I'm really excited about. Okay. So in this urban projection tool, I'm going to go really quickly. Basically, um, it gives urban projections um, that we I just demonstrated. So you can actually see where we think development will happen. Um, and it's a little bit slow because of Zoom, I believe. Okay. And then what we can do is we we have this explore map and we overlay those predicted developments on different um, spatial data to see things like social vulnerability, um, things that are concerned to that city. We're also integrating um, a planning tool. We're calling this a planning tool. This is based on participatory GIS. So basically uh, what we are proposing is that we're gonna use this in uh, community workshops with cities and with residents um, within those cities. And basically trying to um, kind of cast people in the role of kind of a city planner and tell, asking them where they want, for instance, development. So they can say, I want development in this region, in this region. You know? And then maybe they want um, things like green space. And we can collect all this information. And this is hopefully help uh, helpful for the cities themselves, but it's also um, kind of um, representing what people, uh, the current residents actually want for their city. So that was a very quick uh, demonstration. Um, so right now what we're, <clears throat> we're actually doing is we're gonna make our model a little bit more sophisticated We've been testing it with different cities and asking them what are the functionality that they want to integrate in, into the, the tool itself. One of the things that um, cities are, are really interested in is dent densification or kind of uh, redevelopment within the urban core. So we're gonna be integrating that within the tool as well. Um, and so we're trying to get some feedback from different cities um, uh, about how to develop this tool. One of the things that we're really interested in is uh, what spatial layers that we want to include um, when we compare what was just happening for the development um, and uh, the different kind of climate stressors that these cities might um, be interested in to kind of investigate. So we're collecting uh, city specific data and we're doing that right now for Duluth. Um, so we are going to try to make our model a little bit more sophisticated so it addresses the needs of kind of practitioners at, um, in these different cities. So really quickly, um, we believe that kind of engagement with cities um, is key to preparing them for, um, you know, the, the potential that there might be immigration and the eventuality of climate change in those cities. We think that these digital tools will make it a little bit more accessible for uh, a broader section of residents to actually learn and then also contribute um, their opinions um, about what they want for their future. Um, and I think you know that ability to voice preferences will probably, we believe, will make uh, will kind of increase capacity within cities to be able to uh, kind of um, uh, be more sustainable, sustainable in, the, in the face of some of these future challenges. Um, with that, uh, I'm gonna say thank you. Um, this is my email. I'm happy to take um, questions on offline as, as well as online. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Berkel. Um, yeah, I guess you did invite people to, to send you questions. I think they know how to contact you. Also, they probably could through the chat, but I just want to remind folks that we've extended the time frame today. We could probably all benefit from the questions people ask you. So um, 
If people want to hang around after one, after our next presentation, we'll have time for um, some group conversation. Um, but you sure do bring up some really interesting questions. And I think we can all agree that the work you're doing is going to be really useful for Duluth and other Great Lakes cities. And I'm sure that we'll go far beyond that. Um, but there, it's clear there's a lot of work ahead for all of us. Um, so our next presentation is about research conducted and a co-authored report titled Duluth as a Climate Destination, Perceptions of Social, Environmental, and Economic Impacts um, by Monica Haynes and Kim Nichols at the University of Minnesota Duluth, otherwise known as UMD. We're really fortunate to have researchers here in Duluth thinking about this topic and looking deeper at what it would mean for Duluth to truly be a destination city to receive an influx of climate migrants potentially. Um, Monica Haynes serves as the director of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research at the Labovitz School of Business and Economics at UMD and Dr. Kim Nichols Donner as faculty at UMD, Associate Professor of Healthcare Management and Program Director. Um, right now, I will turn it over to Dr. Donner to share her research findings and recommendations, and then we will have time at the end of that presentation for um, questions and group discussion. So, Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or, or morning, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you about our research and, and joining in on the question and answer afterwards. Um, I, our, our research kind of starts in the same uh, place as Dr. Van Berkel's. And I'm going to go ahead and share my slides here. Um, my background is actually in public health. Uh, I am a public health researcher uh, by training. So hopefully everyone can see those slides and somebody yell at me if you can't. Yeah, um, we can. Okay. Um, and so Monica and I, and Monica, feel free to free, jump in here as well. Uh, we started in a similar position um, as Dr. Van Berkel, kind of with this idea that Jesse Keenan brought forth uh, Duluth being the most climate proof city in America um, for all the reasons that were just cited. We tend to have, um, you know, a, a climate that is a, um, a little bit on the cooler side. We have an inland location on the water. Um, and from that uh, exploded a whole bunch of research in the popular press. Um, and Monica and I living in Duluth and being researchers, uh, Monica's background is in economic forecasting, uh, started to talk and ask ourselves, well, what do we need to understand if this is really happening? Um, what are some of the social things that we need to think about as a community? Uh, what are some of the economic consequences that we need to think about and plan for? What are some of the cultural uh, impacts that are going to be happening to Duluth, right? This is where we live. Uh, this is where we work. Um, and this is where, you know, we've chosen to call home. Um, and so it was really important to us. Um, and as we were asking ourselves that question, we kept coming up with, well, okay, what do we need to know if this is going to happen? And then we'd follow up by saying, well, is this going to happen? Um, and so we started kind of looking at the data and trying to understand it better. And so we also went to the literature um, and looked around. And we found that, you know, first of all, as, as was mentioned, we're not um, immune to climate changes here in Minnesota. Um, and this is a little summary of the data that has come out more recently about what's happening in Minnesota with regard to our own climate change. Uh, we're seeing increased winter temperatures. Uh, which means fewer days of snow cover. Uh, we're seeing warmer summer temperatures, as, as was yesterday, a good example, um, and an increase in precipitation, particularly in the spring. 
we also started to look a little bit on the literature of climate migration and asking the question is, what is a climate destination? What is a, um, a recipient city? And we found that the literature breaks, uh, breaks down cities into to three categories. So you have your vulnerable cities, and these are the ones that are mainly experiencing uh, changes to climate, uh, climate events like fire and flood that are um, really detrimental and that people are trying to, to leave. Um, we also have the recipient cities, and these are most likely to receive the largest numbers of people, generally because they are closer to the vulnerable cities and they might also have sudden onset disasters or, or the vulnerable cities are more likely to have sudden onset disasters that push people to recipient city, cities, and then also climate destinations that are more like Duluth. Um, and these are cities that have the potential to possibly brand themselves as being a climate haven. Um, and they tend to be cities that are more, um, have maybe more manageable climate impacts, uh, fresh water, uh, affordable housing, and high infrastructural capacity, um, and, and could possibly be welcoming or have a desire to be more welcoming. Um, and so we kind of started thinking about, okay, if Duluth is a climate destination, how do we fare along those indicators, um, and what's going on? Um, there hasn't been a whole lot um, in terms of the push-pull factors specifically related to climate change. So while there's a wide body of literature talking about push and pull factors more generally, we really don't know what these factors look like in the current climate situations. Uh, we do know that just generally speaking, people tend to move short distances and that whatever is going on for them in terms of pre-existing social and cultural connections help impact that choice. Um, also looking at some of those projections by Matt Hauer um, and Caleb and Robinson, uh, uh, Robinson, Caleb and colleagues, um, it's really challenging as Dr. Van Berkel also mentioned to get a handle on how many people are we trying to forecast a change of a couple hundred people, a couple thousand people, or tens of thousands of people? Um, and so based on estimates that we found out there, it seems like St. Louis County is going to maybe receive between 1,000 to 10,000 new people through 2100, um, which in terms of Howard's research is a small percentage of our current population. Um, it makes us a little bit, um, in his categorizations, maybe a little bit um, uh, less needing to plan because it's a smaller percent of the population. However, the counties surrounding St. Louis County are uh, likely to receive fewer numbers, but a bigger increase in terms of percent population. Um, but there's a lot of caveats too to these models. They tend to focus on things like sea level rise, not accounting some of the climate related sudden onset disasters. And they don't really take into account any of the policy or economic factors that could pull people toward particular destinations. Um, and so what we wanted to do is, is find out more. Um, we talked just a few minutes ago about what are the perceptions of the community. And that's really kind of where Monica uh, and my research fits in with the prior presentation. Um, what are the things that are relevant to stakeholders in the Duluth community, uh, in the Northern Minnesota, Northeastern Minnesota area? Um, and so we, we did interviews with 18 people. Uh, those people represented a variety of different sectors of the community and included uh, climate advocacy groups. Uh, there was clergy people, city and state government, tribal government, tribal uh, nonprofits, researchers, climate scientists, biologists, higher education people. Um, and we also had representation from within the city, uh, regional and state. Um, and so all these different stakeholders were represented. Uh, sometimes the stakeholder represented more than one community. And our goal was really to get a broad cross section of people who were engaged in this type of work, who were the key stakeholders, um, who paid a lot of attention to this in that kind of first qualitative pass. 
And so here you can see the questions that we asked everybody. Um, and we were really trying to get at what were the current social and economic concerns. Um, we had funding from uh, the University of Minnesota Institute on the Environment. Uh, Monica and I had initially thought, well, you know, someday it'd be great to have a model, right? Just like the one we were talking about, or, or, or at least maybe model some of the social and economic impacts, right? So if X number of people come to our community, what ripple effect might that have in terms of our economic um, development or, or our tax dollars or what have you? Um, and we weren't really to that point yet in terms of where the research is. And so that was also what led to our qualitative approach. But we wanted to look at what were the social and economic concerns that were out there um, and what would adaptation and resilience look like from the perspective of key stakeholders. Um, we also asked a little bit about what data they would like to see going forward. Um, so when you think about overlaying the maps, that was kind of the first thing that came to my mind. Here are some other data points that could be um, overlaid uh, with the work that, that, that's going on with that participatory projection modeling. Um, this is a review of the, or the overview of the themes that we found from all of the interviews. Uh, and while um, you know these are on here kind of as a discrete list, really these all interacted with each other. Um, people talked about these in the context of concerns. They talked about these in the context of future concerns. Sometimes they talked about future opportunities. Sometimes they talked about things that were really positive in terms of the Duluth and, and Northeastern Minnesota community. Um, and so as I go through each one of those, you'll kind of see how that, how that played out in terms of what people's thinking were along these themes. And people, I should also add, mainly spoke from the vantage point of where they're working, what community uh, and stakeholder group that they're representing. So the thing that we uh, found that cross cut all the other themes was the concept of equity. And I was really happy to see that social vulnerability index uh, mentioned um, because this was our most, most mentioned theme as well. Um, close to 90% of the people we talked to mentioned it in some way, shape or form. Uh, the biggest concerns as far as equity was concerned were socioeconomic inequalities and also racial and ethnic inequalities um, largely as two concepts that underpinned a lot of other um, inequities. So, so to the extent that entrenched poverty, uh, structural racism underpin things like um, environmental inequity or health disparities, these were really concerns. Um, and it really affected how people viewed the other themes that we saw. Um, and and an, ex uh, an example quote I have there uh, from one of our respondents is, we already have a community that isn't working for everyone unless there's great intentionality in the way we handle growth, it could make problems so much worse. We already have educational, economic, environmental, health, and housing disparities, and we have to figure those issues out for the people we have before we add climate migrants or refugees. Um, and that was really an important thing that came out of the research was this concept of equity and how to plan with an eye toward uh, enhancing equity, right? Maybe not just maintaining the status quo and certainly not making things worse. Um, another area of concern for uh, a lot of the participants, 15 of the 18, in fact, was housing. Um, and when people talk to us about housing, they talked about a lack of many types of housing. Um, I had a, a running list uh, that, uh, of all the different types of housing that people talked about. I um, mean, it was a really extensive list, but to focus down on what caused most of the housing concern was the issue of affordability. Um, in addition to affordability, people talked also about maintenance and adaptability and the age of the housing stock. Um, and so an example that was given from one of our respondents was the fact that if the weather is hotter, we have a lot of old housing, old housing that doesn't have air conditioning, 
old housing that might not be, um, you know, that might be very prone to drafts. How do we even retrofit those old houses as we look at responding to climate change and more people? People also talked about equity here in terms of a mismatch between what is needed and who might be coming. Um, so for example, we have um, an issue with a need for greater uh, affordability, uh, more affordable housing in Duluth, but the people who are coming here because they are escaping climate changes elsewhere might be wealthier. Um, they might want a different type of housing and how do we manage that as a city? Uh, example quote here, the city has a housing crisis, aging housing stock, rents are higher than they should be for a city in the Midwest, <clears throat> and migrants are likely to be affluent and more able to pay higher housing costs. This is going to increase housing costs overall. So what impact is that going to have on our, on our community? People also talked about infrastructure and their concerns. Um, and also the, the fact that infrastructure may be an asset. So with this uh, theme, there was a lot of mixed feelings. People felt that the capacity is there. Uh, Duluth used to have more people. So while we saw that chart with our, um, with our community staying pretty flat in terms of numbers, uh, there was a time that Duluth used to have more people, over 100,000 people in the city. Um, and so that there is a sense that, well, we can handle more urban growth um, in a way that's a little bit more dense. Uh, we also saw that there was concern with relation to the age of the infrastructure, increased demands, climate changes, the flood was mentioned. Um, and so would we be able to dovetail our policy and practice to the future with that existing capacity and move forward in a smart way when it comes to infrastructure? Some saw a lot of opportunity to grow the infrastructure around new people coming to the city. Um, other people talked, and we, we've kind of captured it in here, but this idea that we have um, a lot of green space within the community that is an asset, and we wanted to, people generally felt they wanted to keep it as an existing asset and really not uh, alter that in the future. So as new development occurs, how do we keep our green space intact? Because that's also what attracts people to a community like Duluth. Um, social capital came up uh, and people really talked about resiliency and our supportive networks and that we tend to lean into new cultures to some extent. Um, equity here was also mentioned with a caution that, hey, in addition to all these aspects of social capital, we also have a history uh, in the state of Minnesota of racism and exclusion. Um, and so here's one of the examples of one of the uh, quotes from one of our respondents, that we have extremely high voter turnout, high rates of volunteerism, high rates of financial giving to nonprofits. And all these things are, are, are part of what makes um, Duluth a resilient place to live. Um, when we asked about community and economic development, people really expressed a lot of cautious optimism. Um, and Monica and I were really struck by the, the, the statements that began with if and had the clause of could in there. Um, and so pe people really felt like, well, we there's a lot of opportunity perhaps in terms of new migrants, the ability to maybe attract migrants um, and doing that in a way that is supportive of diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, um, supportive of new perspectives and cultures and supportive of economic growth. Um, and so here's an example of, uh, of a quote in this area, people who are choosing this place may have more of a sense of place, more connectivity, Many are likely to bring a sense of entrepreneurism, a spirit of autonomy and independence. Currently, we are an insular and white community. An influx of new residents could be a beautiful opportunity for a community to benefit from a wider swath of humanity. Um, so just in short, we, um, the respondents really talked about a lot of concerns related to being a climate destination and what that might mean for Duluth. Um, and not just Duluth, but the whole Arrowhead region um, and even parts of northern Wisconsin, right? We share uh, Lake Superior water. Uh, we share, um, you know, we're in a similar commuting zone. There's a lot of, um, a lot of um, desire not to just focus in on Duluth, but to focus more regionally. Um, we have clean water, green space, 
and a high level of social capital, and these things are positives going forward. Um, we have an opportunity perhaps here to attract people uh, and to do it in a way that uh, supports the values of our community and that we should center planning around being proactive and inclusive um, and that we need to do this with an eye toward greater racial and socioeconomic equity. Um, and, and it was interesting as we went back, this really kind of converges with the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, what they've been saying, um, and, and also kind of other literature and, and what, what communities can and should do. Um, and and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and stop there and note that it's good that we're a little bit ahead of schedule and I'd love to field your questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, or, sorry, not Monica, Kim. Um, I, I'll invite Monica, yeah, there and Derek, I was going to say to come off uh, camera. Um, and then 